my name's Jim Casey, if you don't know me, I'm uh, the State Secretary of the Fire Brigade Employees Union here in New South Wales and a proud member of the Greens. I'd like to thank the Political Education Trust for this opportunity to speak today. And I'd also like to thank Adam, actually. Uh, I think that really raises some quite, well, pivotal questions for the period we're going into. Um, and I think we all recognise that, in a sense, Adam and the people working around him are writing the book on how to run a different type of electoral strategy, which really, if the Greens aren't running something a bit different, then we might as well change our name to the Democrats, and I'll see you in the pub. Um, <laughs> not as a member, but I would add. Look, uh, I'm going to be taking a slightly different take um, to Adam, which reflects where I come from and, and where my energies are directed at the moment, which is sort of informed by where the Labor movement's at. Uh, look, the Labor movement, we're at a historical, well not historically low, but the lowest density we've seen in, in some uh, 70 years. Uh, but there's still one million Australians who are involved in, tra in trade unions, in, in their trade union. It's still by far the biggest social movement in the country. And with all of its limitations, it still exercises a different type of power. Really, to be perfectly blunt about it, it has the power to hurt people financially in a way that most of our social movements don't. I say most, not all. But definitely the labour movement has that, has that different quality, that capacity to actually do something uh, in business. Now when you think about it, so much of the political discourse, what passes for discourse in this society, almost takes business for granted. That's just something extra, that's something beyond the debate. We can talk about everything else. We'll talk about parks, we'll talk about drugs, we'll talk about this or that. Business is just business. Uh, one of the nice things about the labour movement is that it's actually inside that process and saying, well, no. Now we assert different kinds of uh, priorities. We want to see something different. We're talking about dignity rather than profit and so forth. Now, from that perspective, which um, informs me, and I think, I mean, everyone in this room to a greater or lesser extent, I think the question that this panel is posing is in fact the wrong one. After Abbott is not the question we should be asking, because turn the clock back. If we've been running this forum about saying, well, what about after Howard? And we just said, well, there'll be some kind of change. We want to keep grassroots stuff going on, the rest of it, and we got rudd. What we really should be saying is, how do we make sure that in the next phase of, of the electoral cycle, the conditions for our kind of ideas and for the society we want to see, how are they improved? Because simply thinking about it in the electoral cycle, I think just means that really what happens is things get worse incrementally. And we've seen that for a whole range of reasons. We've seen that over the past 50 years. Uh, really, uh, the, the last Labor government was considerably to the right to the government of Malcolm Fraser yeah, yeah. in terms of policy. And when you look at that, why is that? Was that some kind of weakness in terms of what people else were doing? Yeah, and I think in a sense it was. But more basically, it was, it was a tilt in the way power was actually exercised outside of the electoral cycle, the way power was exercised in communities, workplaces, the way people actually saw themselves I mean, it's no coincidence, I think, that we're seeing that kind of slide along with a massive, massive decline in the participation of ordinary people in political life. The membership of both the Liberal and the Labor parties are at historic lows. Now, why is that? This speaks to, I think, the kind of questions that we need to be asking in order to identify the answers we need about how can we start to fight to win, as opposed to put up a valiant struggle but just see things slipping away incrementally. So, how do we turn it around? Look, I would prefer to see Tony Abbott returned as Prime Minister with a Labor movement that was growing, with an anti-war movement that was disrupting things in the streets, with a strong and vibrant women's movement, Indigenous movement and a climate change movement that was actually starting to disrupt the production of coal. I would prefer to see Abbott as a Prime Minister in that environment than Bill Shorten as Prime Minister without it. When you pose the question like, I mean, look, I mean, of course, this is a fairly uh, you know, artificial divide. If we had all of those things, I think we'd also have a different Prime Minister. But the point's an important one because it starts to define the real issue we are facing here as not how do we campaign to get the best possible leaders we can into Parliament, and of course we need to do that. But the real question then is what space are those leaders operating in? And if we don't change the reality, then it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many good MPs we've got. Because even with people of the calibre of the two people to my right, if they do not have the social forces behind them, there's very little they can really do. Just a couple of quick observations. I think one of the most significant things we've seen in the last decade from the parliamentary wing of the Greens has not been some of the absolutely inspired policy, the clever trading, the uh, bureaucratic, and I don't mean that in an offensive word, I mean that in an in a actually descriptive word, bureaucratic excellence of actually trying to get things through difficult situations. All of those things are amazing, but I expect nothing less. The more significant, I think, 
was when Bob Brown and Kerry Nettle heckled George Bush. And when you think about that, that was an act which actually turned the entire convention of parliament on its head. It spoke to millions of Australians who did not want to be involved in those insane wars. It did it in such a way as to actually place the Greens as a political party in some kind of you know, recognised national alternative space. And it did it all simply through being a bit naughty, to actually breaking some of those conventions. We need more of that type of activity from all of us, be it you know, rank and file Greens members, be it councillors, be it MPs. I guess I'll just restate it. After Abbott, what next? We need to make sure that the world we are inhabiting after Abbott is one where our ideas and our movements are stronger. And that, for the Greens, I think means, while prosecuting the electoral fights, every one of us needs to be a union member if you can be a union member. If you're in a workplace or an industry which is relatively well organised, you need to be trying to push that harder. All of us need to be immersed inside the movement, a movement for, uh, against climate change. All of the movements, really, which speak to the kind of world we want to be, that should be our bread and butter. We should be leading all of those, we should be trying to actually make them stronger because on the basis of that, we change the world. Parliament comes next. You know, to paraphrase an old German, politicians make policy but not in circumstances of their own choosing. We need to change those circumstances. Thank you.